at a time when so many of our creative spirits, or at least they seem to be creative spirits, sing of man's impotence. One of the most original spirits of our time, Buckminster Fuller, our Buckminster Fuller, sings of man's potency. I, I think uh, everyone aware of his work, and his work has so many facets to it, agrees that Buckminster Fuller is one of the original minds of our time. Bucky Fuller, once upon a time you were called strange, far out. Today you are accepted as seeing tomorrow the way other men look at yesterday. You still as optimistic as you were the last time we met about prospects for humanity? Well, much more so, I should say. The, um, I'm more so because the reasons for my being optimistic before were not entirely mystical, but were predicated on observation of certain fundamental patterns, such as the fact that the human beings don't really know how to make a baby. And this beautiful, extraordinary piece of design we call the new life just emerges from the womb. And, and as much as I know the parents don't really know what it's about, they talk about what college they're going to send it to and so forth. <laughs> uh, and life is very successful despite man's great ignorance. So that uh, I, I've been observing those kind of patterns of life in gestation as the new life is in the womb. I see that really the whole of mankind seems to be in a state of gestation. I think the, the whole of mankind is about to emerge from a universal womb into really a new kind of relationship to universe. If we had a, if telepathy or uh, this uh, sense of communication which we all experience from time to time to the point where it's so surprising that it can't be explained by probability. If that telepathy becomes confirmed in our next few years, as I think it will be, as ultra, ultra, ultra high frequency communication, then we can assume that little babies have the same, possibly they have better Clearer, clearer stations that are working better than uh, not had many years to break down. So we have. I'm going to have all the babies in the wombs. I think in, on Earth there are at least uh, 100 million babies in wombs at any one time. So that I have all the 100 million babies in the wombs all around the Earth, all communicating with each other by TV. This ultra, ultra, ultra. High. So I say, how things over your place, Joe? And <laughs> <laughs> wonderful here, very warm. And, <laughs> We seem to be, my universe seems to be juggling up and down. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, it seems that uh, Buckminster Fuller speaks outrageously. I say it seems this way, and yet you've come up with so many outrageous explanations that turn out to be right and accurate and true and practical. Isn't that a phrase you, you once used, Bucky, as you're talking now about babies and ESP and communicating? Man knows so much, it does so little. Brunovsky was saying once, Brunovsky was saying that, we know more than, I, we have more facts at our disposal than Einstein did. What I want yeah. to establish in your, in your thoughts, so first before we go to this, is the concept then of, of the hundred million babies who have a, then a, an environment which, which they're now becoming familiar. And then to suddenly be born, and admitted from the womb and into this relationship to, to man that we know around the earth, but it must be a very su sudden, surprising affair, yet it is, it is a due process of life. And it did consist of, in, in that gestation period, of the growth of many cells. And so I, I see <coughs> also, I'm going to give you another kind of cellular group, the little coral al animals. Each coral animal making little excretions which make his own little local shell and he add his excretions to somebody else's shell. But a little in individual coral animal, utterly unaware of the other, what the other coral animals are doing, utterly unaware of the shape of the great coral frond of, uh, consisting of the millions of little coral animals, very much less aware of the coral reef <laughs> and its effect on the Pacific Ocean currents <laughs> The effect of that, uh, then the coral reef on the ocean currents, and the effect on man on the land. All these are, no question about these effects, we were able to trace them. But I just want to get to the concept of the utter unawareness of the little individual coral animal of his relationship to a bigger pattern. So I have now man on earth, 
as an individual, utterly, uh, with his own little excretions, his uh, little o own local preoccupations, utterly aware, unaware of the larger coral reef in effect he is building. So I spoke then about all the babies who are in the womb suddenly being born and, and having entirely new kind of experience. I speak now then of all men as part of cells of something bigger. There's something called mankind coming into an utterly new relationship with the universe. I've, I have a strong feeling from the all the trends that I read that man is about to emerge into so completely a new relationship with the universe that the older generations aware, uh, familiar with the earlier womb-like, we might say, concept of Chicago <laughs> will be uh, very, uh, very ill-prepared for this extraordinary new relationship of total humanity, which will, uh, which we, I, I see coming on by virtue of our developing our extraordinary awareness of the behavioral uh, characteristics of life. We just begin to know that, that the new young life has <coughs> very much greater capacity to learn than men had ever known before. That the really all the education is through at seven years old by the time we send them to something called school. And that we are now getting ready to turn that seven, that pre-seven year into its really high potential, which means then there is a younger generation coming through to an entirely new relationship to the universe, which we as older generation are going to have a hard time to understand, which they will understand. We're already getting just even a little break it's a tiny little break, but in the bringing in, for instance, something called the new mathematics at school, you suddenly find the parents used to enjoy so much helping the children with their mathematics, suddenly finding themselves un unable to help their children with what they're learning. The children are, are moving through into entirely new uh, competence, and, and so say that this is the beginning of a birth of a new relationship to, to universe because that new life, if it really is allowed to develop with its, in its highest potential, its way of looking at the universe would be so different <laughs> as to not look at all the way our newspapers talk of life today. Well, doesn't this pose the problem of our time? You speak of the infinite potentialities, possibilities that man has, and you describe this, and obviously, Bucky, you see this, but doesn't this pose the problem today of our societies, the various worlds, the national governments, the way we think? We still think in a limited way that is, man thinks so little, as you said, and uh, thinks so much, and yet does so little. Mm. How then can the molders of the different societies be aware of what you are aware? Isn't this the problem? The, the mo uh, my, my, uh, my point is that the universe, the Almighty, are the molders and not the societies. I mean, the, uh, the various uh, associations of, of this group or that group feel reason for needing to associate. They're not going to form up what I'm talking about at all. They will, in their... Um, apprehensions and fear, their conditioned reflexes are going to be uh, opposed to these things that are happening, but th they're going to happen. What I'm interested in is what is permitted to happen in the terms of the fact that the Earth does contain still its atmosphere, does have all these extraordinary <laughs> processes working, that the human brain does have very much high capability. So I simply expect this young, ch the, this whole new world of the young children informed by all the experience men have had before, plus the, the new capabilities, the integration of all that knowledge is going to bring about an entirely new way of looking at, at things. If I may play Cassandra for the moment. Now, you, last time you spoke of Einstein and your particular understanding of Einstein at the time and how he knew that fission is possible, mm -hmm. and yet what he thought of eventually destroyed a man. You spoke of his horror. Mm -hmm. And yet, aren't we, isn't, I'm being Cassandra now. Doesn't the clock work against us in this respect with more and more atomic bomb-possessing nations and thinking as we do about uh, nationalities and states? Well, just think of, uh, go back to the Bronze Age and there were not so many people around and they'd all learned how to make stilettos and those stilettos, they could just simply kill everybody else and the last one commit harikari. Same trick we could do today with the atomic bomb. And we, we, we've always had the ability to destroy ourselves. It's always been there. Even without the stiletto, could jump in the river. <laughs> And uh, man has always had the ability to destroy himself, and I simply am I'm utterly convinced that the, uh, there is a much more powerful total subconscious intuition of total man that time to time manifests itself. You and you, I'm sure, uh, with myself and my, most of humanity, are utterly surprised that suddenly a voice of, uh, that will appear in an election or a refusal to do that, that suddenly there's a manifest, a, a great deep wisdom of mankind that's much greater than anything that's manifest in any of the forecasts or an, 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 an analysis of, of a, by any political commentator. 
as you're talking, is that a sonic boom we're hearing? I was just curious. It seemed to be a sonic boom we're hearing, very poetic, I thought, this I, poetic I, counterpart. I felt that there were a couple of sonic booms, I, I thought, probably. That to have sonic booms over Chicago today, as I'm talking here, it's 1965, and I recall in uh, 1927 in, in Chicago when I first started doing the work that I am doing, wheeling my little child in her baby carriage in Lincoln Park. And I was amazed because a little biplane went over Lincoln Park. Airplanes were not very common in those days. I, you, you watch then, then I'll, 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 I'll hold it. No, I'll, I'll watch this now. The, uh, j just to remind ourselves of how uncommon it was that same year that Lindbergh flew his airplane across the Atlantic. And I can tell you that the year after 1927, when I was wheeling my baby in, in Lincoln Park, the first night mail was flown out of Chicago, and it went out in a, a biplane, cloth covered, covered wings biplane, so that the art was still very uh, early. And in fact, it was three years later that the first aluminum airplanes came into being, so that. Uh, uh, for when I saw that little airplane in the sky, <laughs> and it was a very strange sight, I, I said, isn't it amazing? Here's my child looking up at that airplane, and she has just, she's just been born. So that, uh, that, that airplane in the sky is almost is as natural to her as a bird, because when I was born, the airplane did not exist. In fact, I was nine years old when the airplane was invented. So I said, I see this is a very different kind of environment with an airplane in, as normal in your sky. It's because it, it was really the bit, sort of the beginning of uh, impossible sense things happening where the older generation said that you can't possibly fly and you can't talk by air, but suddenly there was the radio which came in my day too. So I said, now then, my daughter who was, I was wheeling the baby carriage who had an airplane as normal in her sky, uh, now has her daughter, and her daughter was born 11 years ago, and that daughter was born in New York, and they took her to an apartment in the northern end of New York, which, and, and it was in a little wooden house on a high hill, and it was right in the flight path for the western in, in continental bound flights out of LaGuardia and Idlewild, and the planes were going overhead at rate almost for a minute, and this little child then, in her crib, <laughs> would hear this, this airplane go, and people say, airplane. And this, this happened, she had that experience so many times that instead of having her first word, mummy or daddy, which most children have, or something, the first word she ever mouthed was air. And so they would take her then in, her, in their arms to the window and they'd show her the airplane to identify what that sound was. So. It happened that she was born in the fall, late November, and the trees, the leaves were off the trees outside the house. So she saw many thousands of airplanes before she ever saw a bird. And I saw the children's books that were sent to her, which were the same kind of children's books that you get in any bookstore. It's a tradition of what a children's book would be. And the same children's book that was sent to me when I was a child, so they were farmyard, there was a barn and all the nice natural things that a child would see, the horse and the pig and the cow and the goat, sheep, rooster. Uh, and my daughter, uh, my granddaughter <laughs> in New York City uh, looked out the window and saw those airplanes and she saw the automobiles going by by the millions. But when they gave her this, this farm book, she'd never seen a sheep or a cow or thing. And as if you gave her these imaginary pictures of dragons and things, and she was very accommodated, but she laughed about it, they were amusing. <laughs> but they weren't natural to her. Doesn't this raise a, a challenging question, Bucky? Uh, say a 20th century Audubon would ask, isn't there not a danger of the sound or whir of the plane drowning out the song of the nightingale? Uh, it's a poetic statement, Stud, and, and, and I also f feel it's a poignant statement, and I know that I've come to wonder where the sound of those birds are, but I find when I get into the deep country, the birds go on. They, they, birds know something, uh, first place they fly over, they can see things the way we see it from the airplane now, and they can see the patterns very beautifully. I think one of the most amazing things is the way the, the ducks and the geese learn where the, the safe guards have been 
put up for them by man so that they know the, the refuges, they fly right to them. And the same way the birds are now getting, they're flying around, but they're, they're picking other places where we just have to go fairly deep in the country to find them. Anyway, I'm also confident about uh, the great big processes of nature, and there are patterns that come and go. And there was a time, you might say, isn't it sad because we don't have the, the wonderful uh, growling of the dinosaurs. They must have been very poetically beautiful at some time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not uh, bothered at all by the, the nature's own uh, due process, because I, 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 we didn't invent the bird, and we didn't invent the man, and I see that these things are moving along some very extraordinary evolution. The word process, you know, uses, I know this is a key word, not only in your vocabulary, in your life, isn't it? You, you think of man as what an evolutionary process. Man isn't is, it? is a, a entirely a process. He is not a thing. There's a great tendency to think of ourselves like the mannequins in the store windows as China dolls, but we are anything but. And we are, remember, just remember, we are born and conceived at approximately no weight at all. Then we weigh in at seven pounds. And we say, everybody say, oh, look, look at that child. That's just a spitting image of Aunt Mary and Uncle Joe. And so this, sure enough, there is a pattern. He seems to smile the same way, right eyes cocked a little. And so that same child goes to, gets from seven pounds to 70. So we got to used to then looking at 170 pounder <laughs> with the same patterns as, as sort of the China doll. And, and we see him around quite a lot, so we begin to misinterpret uh, this extraordinary phenomena that is there. But that same man can lose from 170, he can go back to, to 100. <laughs> and he's just the same man, so what is there is not the thingness or the pounds or the potatoes he ate, <laughs> but an extraordinary pattern of integrity, which was the fact that you could see little Aunt Mary and so forth and the twinkle in the eye of that child. And so I, I myself, uh, deeply impressed then with the continual process of the, I think we uh, eat, uh, we take on somewhere around seven tons of food each, and uh, we breathe enormous amounts, uh, enormous tons of water, and that's not us. Uh, uh, we are the capability to associate those extraordinary pattern principles, which are the chemical elements, and somehow rather to employ that integrating uh, process to do something called communication. And what you're doing with me, you're uh, uh, saying something to me and getting me to talk about patterns, you're talking about patterns, is in the end by far the most important part of all this. And so in that process we do regenerate and so, we, so there's an extraordinary part of the invention to have, to have the baby factory here and the, <laughs> the baby factory manager there and they get together and make baby. So this, this, what you call, process. Uh, this process, what you call man, clearly you say is more than the amount of food he consumes or or the amount of mechanical contrivances he may use, isn't this a way related to the, if I may just introduce another figure who is part of your heritage, if not your life, your great aunt, Margaret Fuller, the transcendentalist of New England in the middle of the last century. She, how, how did this remark, one of the most remarkable women of American history figure in your life, your, your great aunt? It, uh, she, uh, she died, she was drowned, you know, on Fire Island on her way back from Europe. Uh, way back in, in 1850, so that, that happened more than a, about a half century before I was born, so that my relationship to her was not even my early childhood days when they told me that I had a great Aunt Margaret, there's a picture, that, that doesn't mean a thing, or that there were some books in the shelves. What, uh, my way of meeting Margaret was to d discover her in print. I was reading, uh, I was studying Goethe and some of Goethe's theories of, on time, when I ran into a book called Margaret Fuller and Goethe, and then I began to read Margaret, and I suddenly found Margaret Fuller saying in that book, <laughs> in a conversation about Goethe, things that I was saying in my own investigation regarding time, so that I suddenly found there was a kinship between this human being and myself and the, our way of looking at things, so I began to read much more of it. So I discovered her not as my aunt, but as, as a, a human being who communicated a half century earlier. But I do think that, that just as there are certain family uh, traits and characteristics, and I look back at the family, my father and grandfather, so I can see their characteristics. So there must, and there are certain, even way people laugh or cackle or anything like that, that there's a little, that kind of characteristic. So there probably is a little bit of a twist the way you look at things. And so I may have a little bit of the uh, twist of that way you look at things at Margaret Hatton. If I may suggest, uh, Buckminster Fuller, that more of a little bit, the fact that she and you, she, 
ahead of her time, she drowned in 1850, spoke of the state of women, uh, knew what was going on in Italy, friend of Mazzini. You, ahead of your time, both looked upon the beginning as strange, being somewhat crackpotty. And the world began to realize, just as Margaret Fuller died, and in the midst of your life, the truth and the almost oracular quality that both of you have. So it's your, as the grandfather may have a twinkle that the grandchild has, you and your great aunt seem to have this quest for man's possibility of being better than he is. She, I, I know that I am, uh, uh, in all my thinking, uh, I am uh, prone to shun the way school taught, tried to teach me to think school tried to teach me to forget about the universe and to just look at A, B, and C, and one, two, and three. I don't. I, I, I must always start with the universe. I, I start from the whole, and within the whole, I can find the particular. But I don't think I can get anywhere by just being paying attention to the particular. I never can be a super specialist or, or a horse with blinders on so they can't see the rest of the road. And I, see, I know that Margaret uh, was very prone that way, and her writing makes it very clear. Uh, paradoxically, <laughs> she's become known to the world in a popular way f from a very stupid little anecdote about this way of looking at the universe, which was completely misunderstood. There's a book uh, uh, out that uh, came out this last year by Perry Miller. Perry Miller was head of the uh, uh, Department of Early American Literature at Harvard, and he, he just died after writing this book, and the book came out during this, uh, just this time last year, and it's called Margaret Fuller by Perry Miller. It's in paperback. And he opens that book by talking about the anecdote, too. The anecdote is about Margaret Fuller uh, in conversation with Carlyle in England not long after her arrival there, in which Carlyle tells the anecdote, not Margaret. And the word has come down about Carlyle. And Carlyle said, um, uh, Margaret Fuller said, I accept the universe. And he said, Egad, she better. And they were, so this is so amusing. That, that, that time, they were looking at Margaret's a crack pot, and, and, the, and the smart Carlyle had, uh, had found this, uh, this uh, woman sort of egotistically identifying herself personally with the universe, and nobody else counted in the club. But what Margaret was thinking about, as you read, uh, read her, but just what I said to you, she, she must start her thinking, her reasoning with the universe. So when she said, I accept the universe, she was simply saying, I start off, my premises are the universe. And then, then from there we see where, where are you studs Turkle in, on the, on the uh, where is the earth? <laughs> and what star group? And, what, and how does there happen to be an earth in a star group? And how very strange thing that a man's on it, and how is man able to exist there? And there's a studs Turkle in Chicago, a little, where we have a little, few buildings environment controls and she'd identify you in history very quickly and and uh, her, her thinking was was exciting to the men about her in her day because she did see herself she, she could see herself and her fellow men in history and she could see the struggle of man in the universe as a, as a total struggle she began to see if man is having a function in the universe how did it, why, why was he there not as a, not as a passenger in a strange ship, but as as a, a working function of universe. And she wanted to understand that function. Isn't this the way you look at it? At man too, man in connection. There's a phrase, another phrase, Carlyle used about her that may or may not have been apocryphal. This, uh, that she seeks to swallow the world like her oyster. That is very, very rightfully so. That is, man. She wanted to swallow the world, the universe, as her egg or oyster. Isn't this right, though? Uh, she had extraordinary uh, uh, sort of, I might say, a muscular will, a drive <laughs> that people mistook as, as a sort of a, uh, a vain, boastful ego. She was said to have said, <laughs> and uh, Perry Miller says, it, it's beginning to turn out that she was she was right. She said she knew of no one in her day who knew as much as she did. She said she wished it wasn't so. No, no, I, I, <laughs> but uh, Perry Miller says it's turning out now as we go back over the record that apparently was true. So she she uh, she really was 
it probably hurt her a little to say it, but this had mistaken us as a, a very boastful ego. And, and Carlyle, in saying this about the oyster and so forth, was, was stressing a popular viewpoint about Margaret at that time. I would look at, uh, I was looking at the opposite point of view in reference to you, that is, uh, just the opposite, that the universe and the world are so full that you want to drink of it as much as possible. She went everywhere. She saw Carlisle in British Isles, saw the Brownings in, in Italy, uh, saw she George Sand in, years, yeah. in France, traveled all over and worked with Mott Senior. You, the world is yours too. Is going to, you are in New Delhi one day, you are in Ghana the next day, offering your credo, your, your approach. Is, I meant this in a very, what man can do, what one Buckminster Fuller is saying man can do and is doing. Well, there are a great many people traveling around the world as I am. I think as I'm a, one of a class of something better than a million who, who are covering about as much territory as I am. I'm averaging a trip around the world every year and a half, not because I'm trying to go around the world, but just simply the pattern. I used to be going back from uh, New York to Chicago in the 20s, on the 20th century, and, and, and that was a little bigger pattern. But now I just find that the, the whole world is involved in, in the places I have to go. I, incidentally, I have a discipline, which is I don't go any place unless I'm an ass to go there. There is only one way in which I would break that rule, and that is when my granddaughter and my grandchildren are on the West Coast, and I have an opportunity to go to see them, so I would go there. But I'd say that really is almost a calling, too. <laughs> they, 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 have, they, they draw me. But um, I, I'm, never, I'm not a tourist. I don't go on curiosity. I never go around and ask anybody to listen to me. So my trips around the world are primarily because people ask me to come and talk to them. And it's because I think uh, that I'm f I'm, I have such disciplines, not only go where I'm asked, uh, that makes it possible for me to read the pattern of where I am uh, asked as being significant. So I'm used to studying big patterns like that. Uh, Bucky, this is what I, was, I think you said what I was trying to say. I may have goofed on it. And that's that you, in a sense, the new kind of man that you speak, a universal man. That is, they seek what you have to give. What's the geodesic dome idea, whether it be in India or in the Soviet Union or... Uh, Asia or, or China, wherever it is, is do you see this in the 20th century? This new kind of, you see the 20th century as being different than the 19th, less materialistic. Utterly, utterly different. I see that uh, the uh, calculating machine is going to take over function and function of men. That the automation will take over others, and men are going to have to find entirely new relationships in the universe. They're going to be much pleasanter relationships. In fact, the ones that they were giving the greatest capability and the ones that relate to their brain and to vision and to and to reason and not to the automation, because all men have always had automation. We, uh, we just had lunch a few minutes ago, and, and you don't know what's happening in your lunch now, but it's all automated. It's being processed and sent out to various glands, and made. In, some of it's being made in the hair, some made in flesh, and so forth. And some of it's been sent out by breath, and you're not controlling that at all. It's all automated. So we've always had automation, but some of the automation is going to take over more and more of the tasks, and in relation to the external metabolics of man. And we're going to be much, uh, man's going to be greatly preoccupied with, with patterns of very significance to the kind of things we are talking about now. Now, I would then say that man used to be the, uh, we, uh, I was born in the era of the specialist, and almost everybody is trained to be specialist, trained to be specialist. And I set about to be uh, purposefully comprehensive, just the opposite. And for this reason, I have found that my my kind of pattern, the kinds of things that I discover, has for the moment been different from the, that of my fellow men who were specialists in finding out a great deal about, about very small areas. And I've wanted to put all that together and learn ways to do so. I, I don't think I have any unique capability, but my pattern is just that different for, by, by that, for, for that reason. And I also made up my mind that you don't just find out something to entertain yourself. You must find out things in order to be able to turn that to advantage. So I must turn everything, not just in a philosophical statement, but into actually tools. I must re, reorganize the environment of, of man. I felt that this is a function we're given to re reorganize our environment by which of which then man, m greater numbers of men can prosper. That's been, that's been my, my main undertaking. Now because I then gave myself that kind of a task, a, a what I call a design revolution versus a political revolution, and because I deliberately was comprehensive, I find that my kind of deliberate training then is very different from the deliberate training of others with, with almost uh, just exception, say, some artists. Artists often do this spontaneously. 
So I find artists have tended to be my friend, but I'm, time and again I am asked by an interviewer uh, or even somebody who is interested in affecting some end, do you, uh, who else do you know who thinks the way you do or does what you do? And, and I find it very strange to have to answer, I don't know anybody else. And it's not because then I think of myself unique, but simply because I really did choose a very different grand strategy, and not because I think that I have capabilities other human beings don't have. So my difference really is in the intuitions that made me start off in various ways. And so there you could say there are intuitions that uh, I also come along as family traditions to encourage intuitions, for instance. I think I was encouraged in my family. I remember uh, that could relate to a Margaret Fuller kind of, a, uh, of, of, a, of an influence. The last time, there's so many questions I want to ask you. We, we can turn this tape, there's no problem. You know, here, there's so many questions to ask you, Mr. Fuller. The, uh, you spoke, remember, of your... You call me Bucky. Bucky, yeah. of your boyhood in Penobscot Bay. You, you learned from nature and from uh, the old uh, seamen, too, didn't you? the old sailors. Yeah, indeed, it the, I, I found the sailors very extraordinary teachers. They, are, they are, do not communicate well to a man they feel is just a, a stranger who's trying to exploit them or do, who doesn't want to understand. Uh, but if, they, if you're a child and you show uh, enthusiasm and love for what they're doing, then they will, they will just open themselves up and show you how they exactly how they bait that line, just where the fish are, and so forth, these wonderful uh, pieces of experimentally acquired knowledge which they required in great pain and cold winter days and ice and the water there. And uh, to learn then how to really, the quick way you will tie a line, how, never mind about the yachting magazines, what, what is necessary to keep that boat on top of the water and get arriving safely at destination, carrying the load it needs to carry, and how do you maintain it and keep it there? And uh, so I, I learned from those sailors, and, and uh, those sailors in Maine were very interesting ones because they also were usually farmers. They lived on islands. The island was sort of a big boat, and, and uh, these, the smaller boats that went fishing in with the small boats went off in the big boat. But they learned how to then to grow things on the land and how to supply their boats. And they didn't have to go to the mainland for very much. They, uh, they, they milked their cow and they made their butter and, and they, uh, they grew corn. They didn't grow much wheat. They would, they would be liable to buy their flour on the mainland. There was very little they traded for. They'd carry, so they'd take their fish to the mainland. They learned how to get on with, with nature with approximately no contact with the rest of, of civilization. And, and I, I, I think that's possibly the most important of all my young experiences. So they, these sailors then, Bucky, these sailors who... Sailor farmers. These sailor farmers who did the job from beginning to end, uh, they knew what the end product of the work would be. They were comprehensive men, weren't they? Very extraordinary. So we could say the farmer and the, the fisherman has been for a long, long time. The farmer tended to, to be able to get on almost entirely on his own. But uh, all men will always discover in the end that they can't get on without other men. <laughs> but it, isn't this one of the problems of a man working in a factory today? He doesn't know what he, he turns the screw but he doesn't quite know what the end product of his work will be. Doesn't this destroy so much of... Uh, I think, unfortunately, there have been so many interruptions between the screw and the nut and, and the, the relationship of that nut finally to a bolt and a bridge and then a radio set and then a meat chopper <laughs> uh, that man hasn't been allowed they put enough time in thinking about those connections and how important those nuts and bolts are <laughs> as a nut and bolt a man, because he doesn't make them, he just stands by the machine, the machine makes it. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the struggle for, for life has been so, so hard. Up, up to just this last decade, in the whole history of man Earth, there seemingly was not anywhere nearly enough to go around. Therefore, the majority of human beings assumed it was you or me. And you might be the people guarding this, this good farmland, and, and you knew there's some other people didn't have good farmland. They're coming around, so you, you trusted in the, the, the local knight. He became the local knight by saying, I will guard your fields, and you just come up in the castle when the marauders come around, we'll, we'll clean them up. So you had a... And, uh, 
early manifestation of man, there was enough to go around, and, and uh, they really bad. So even as we, more, we got to do more with less, we did have more to go around. You might say, how could you possibly have more to go around? How could Malthus have been wrong? Well, Malthus didn't think about the fact that if you were able to, to pick the f food in the field, and you were able to refrigerate it, that you might be able to get here, because he assumed that most of the f food was going to rot in the field, or that even if you did pick it and got into baskets, it would rot before you could, you couldn't send it around the world. So, but today, we can send it around the world, so there's no reason why anything that grows shouldn't reach a mouth. <laughs> So and, and he couldn't count on that. So those are the kind of things that have come in in the meantime. Meantime, however, we've got a very complex kind of an accounting system, all of which was worked up. In, for instance, the word failure is in our accounting system. For instance, the word mortgage. Mortgage is a terrible word. Death. Deathage. Mort, mort is death. Deathage. We have deathage as part of our... Every house has deathage on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we just assume death all the time in this accounting system. Only a few are going to get through. And the whole accounting system is fraught with that. And so this poor man is getting paid for his not suppose getting paid by a clerk who wonders whether he's going to ever, he's not producing anything. He's just putting things to ink on a paper. They can't pay me for that. That uh, Nobody can eat it. And uh, uh, people are questioning whether their jobs have any security at all. So there's an enormous amount of fear about whether, how you're going to get on. But the, the great changes uh, that I've spoken about, enormous changes coming. One of the fascinating changes it began to loom into sight, even at the political level, where I assume things, where man is dullest and, and uh, the most, he calls himself brutally practical. But, but uh, we have Eisenhower and Khrushchev coming together in, in, uh, in uh, Switzerland in 1954, 10 years ago. We have the first meeting of the heads of all the states of the world. We have the scientists are with them, and the scientists suddenly say to them, it is safe for you, Mr. Headman, to say to the other headman and say to the world, because the world is listening, that it is possible now to harvest and preserve and distribute that food in such a way that we could take care of everybody. An absolutely new note came into the life of man at this moment. This has not as yet been realized, as yet we've only taken care of around 40% of humanity because we're going through in quotas in our own country to tenderly say, no, we, you can't put that wheat in a field in wheat anymore, we're, you're going to get too many, the prices will go down. We don't just pr produce and distribute and get it to the people. We have the ability, but we are as yet f just tied in with all kinds of our laws of yesterday that related to the fact that only a few are going to survive and, and these are hard laws made, in a sense, by those who were the successful ones who wanted to exclude. And uh, we're going to have to change that, and we will change it. And we, we, uh, it, it's, it's, you're, 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 you and I are in the public <laughs> world, and you, you said to me just earlier here, uh, yes, we now have this coming looming in, in the view that there could be enough to go around. With this new, the new generation growing up now, our babies are going to grow up in a world in which in, in ne they never will think. I spoke about an utterly new world, a world in which it is assumed there's plenty to go around. The, which is, you don't, have to, you don't have to have a job to prove your right to live. Where you, where you, the first thing you're going to think of is, how, instead of not, how am I going to earn a living, but is what needs to be done and, and what, am I, what am I interested in, in and what, where might I make a contribution? What extraordinary new preoccupation of man. This will involve a redefinition of work, wouldn't it? Would, you know, that is, uh, man need not earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. It's called for a redefinition of a Puritan ethic, too, wouldn't it? Work will be the most privileged word we have. The, the right to work will be not, of course, with, with the muscle, but with the, the, the right to work with your brain, work with your, with your mind. And uh, you are born with that, but just getting, getting accredited by the other man to be allowed to... To, to use that tool and so forth, and, and to get credit enough so he helps you and cooperates with you, and you make a breakthrough on behalf of your fellow men. The next one, the, the, that, that is going to, that's work. And work will be the most beautiful, beautiful thing we can do. It's pure poetry. So the idea of, of food, clothing, shelter, this will be the lot. Uh, we now have, for the first time in the history of man, the era abundance for all. This is quite yes, possible, yes. isn't it? Just as we're used to the idea of having enough air, we don't, uh, People don't think much about that air, but when we have a great fire in a theater, 
there's panic, and suddenly there's no air, and there's people suffering. Then, then they're so unused to the idea of not having air, they tramp right over each other, kill each other brutally, they run over each other's bodies, run over children, go mad. They're so used to having air, so they don't know how to behave on a basis of there's not enough to go around of air. So we will, we, uh, the, the assumption that there's enough to go around will be uh, everywhere and uh, be a very different kind of an uh, attitude. So wars become obsolete for two reasons then. One, there are no survival what with nuclear bombs, and the other is there's no relevance to it. In, uh, as if there's war for food, for survival, to, there's no let's, relevance. Let's get at what are the fundamentals of war. I, I will agree that you have conditioned reflexes, which you can condition, condition, so you can develop a fighting cock by, by inbreeding fighting cocks, so that we probably have quite a little inbred fighting men still today who were good uh, halibut men, a good, a good swordsman and so forth, and we probably inbred those in the days gone by, so there are probably a lot of fighting instincts still in man. But that is not what I'm really getting at, because we can crossbreed those people and we can breed that out again. What is really important is the reason pardon we you, reason you, you we can breed war. that out again. You said, pardon me, but yes, you said something very out. fascinating. Oh here. yes, you can breed out a warlike. Cro yes, uh, we take a good racehorse, and you you uh, cr crossbreed him with a with a good pitcher on, and then he's no longer a good racehorse. <laughs> he gets to be a much better comprehensive horse. You can put him in harness, you can ride him, you can jump him, or anything, and you work him. So. Uh, the, 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 what, the specialization, what, the inbreeding is a specialization. <laughs> and so when we want a good racer, we inbreed, but we inbreed at the cost of other general capabilities. You, you breed out the, exclude the general capabilities and leave only special capabilities. So I think we probably did inbreed some special capability in w war, uh, war, uh, war wiseness and uh, sort of uh, slyness and things. But that could, could be cross-spread out quite rapidly. Are you saying that human nature, you know the old cliche, human nature is human. Human nature, you're saying, can be altered for the better. Human nature as we've known it. Uh, oh, oh, yes. So that, uh, <coughs> I, first place I'm going to get out the war itself. The war was there because there wasn't enough to go around. If there's not enough to go around, I mean, I'm not just talking about this in sort of a club uh, uh, Dilettante men, I'm saying one of us is going to die, one is going to starve. Now, starving is a slow process and really very uncomfortable, particularly if your family is starving and you have the pain of watching the people who love starving. So, in a sense, a war, if there's not enough to go around, then just getting up swords and, and cut, cut each other down, at least have a good sport, but in a sense, it was nobler and you, and you had the pain over quicker. <laughs> And so I, I don't, I think people looked on war in a very different way than the way we do today. But that war was because there was not enough to go around, period. Next, then, I say, we are going now to have enough to go around, so the re basic re reason for war is gone. But I said we also, just that so we could inbreed high running capability for a horse, <laughs> but by virtue of outbreeding general capabilities and general adaptability. We find that horse then, when there's a fire in the barn, he doesn't have the sense enough to get himself out. <laughs> so I will cross, uh, we will begin, man is just inherently crossbreeding, the, the drives are to crossbreed, <laughs> so that he will crossbreed and he will crossbreed out any of the, any of the total, uh, uh, I, I don't think he's a very deep incidentally, but I, uh, the, the now bred in, or in, inbred uh, uh, tendencies to just to fight. Uh, I, I myself, I, I can understand physical excellence. I was an ath athlete, and I, I love football and so forth. I, 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 I had no tendency to guard my physical comfort. I really enjoyed the, the, the struggle with the muscle and so forth. And uh, I, I didn't feel that you did get hurt. You got crushed and so forth, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, so that kind of thing is in us, and I, I can understand then people being enthusiastic about boxing and so forth. But I can't ever really personally be I, I, can, I can think about that exhilarating thing of the, of the athletic battle, but I can't be enthusiastic about knocking a fellow's nose with a side and, and finally just getting crushing down this, uh, abusing some very beautiful tools any more than I enjoy taking up a clock and, and just slamming it on the floor and so forth and expect it to function. And so I think we will get over that, that whatever there is in here that is, it might say, a malevolent fighting instinct, which might get down to the sly. That will, that's sort of the inbred thing, that'll be cross-bred out. There'll be residual in, in man, and we'll have to do something about it for generations to come, but it will not be predominant enough to 
uh, to push the great button. <laughs> Well, assume then that the new generation coming up, the one you described, much more advanced and knowing so much more than uh, those preceding it. Assume then that no nut pushes a button. This world you see, there's so many things to ask you, Bucky, that you have foreseen. Do you see a roofless, ask questions, not specific ones. Do you see, I'm thinking of your geodesic dome, do you see actually roofless, uh, r roofed cities, cities roofed ever? Uh, I Instance think, we uh, man uh, elements. Uh, uh, we're continually doing more with less, and my geodesic domes do a very great deal with very little. But I think they're only symptomatic studs, and I wouldn't be surprised if we found ways to control that environment over the city without even seeing the roof there. That that would be an electrical field control and so forth, and so we could we could make the water go and dump over here and pipe it there and so forth, whatever it might be. The use of materials. I know this is your unique use of materials. You once said, I remember last time how Neanderthal building, building was, the process of, in contrast to aircraft, and you spoke of uh, materials stronger than their very weight. This is part of the new, new ways in which materials, old and new, can be used. Uh, I, I uh, don't find uh, us dependent on materials. Th this is an old time way of thinking about it and talking studs in the building world that what you can do depends on the materials at hand. So it was true when you wanted to build a house and you didn't have any ship to bring you anything else and you couldn't afford anything else either. So you used the stone was there or the tree that was there. Uh, but both, both tree and stone are very complex chemistries. <laughs> and uh, we've learned to take the metal out of that stone and we've ta learned to take all kinds of things out of the tree. So plastics are the same kind of chemistries where we use the special aspects of the patterns. Now, the main thing about materials today, man used to be dependent on them. Now he makes the materials and we are, we're at a point where we're in, uh, our, our great research work is continually saying, what are the tasks to be done? This is in the advanced jet airplane and, and even more so in the rocketry. You say, I must have a something that will hold together, have a certain shape and must have a certain strength for certain stresses, and must be able to do that at a re-entry heat. And that material, so-called material, didn't exist. So man is, goes about and develops that material. And so he is now making the materials. So he's not dependent on the materials. He finds out what is the task to be done, what are its behavior characteristics, and he finds out how to reorganize the chemistries in such a way to bring about those characteristics. And that is very possible. And that, that is really the new order of affairs. In 1932, man isolated, made his 92nd isolation of a chemical element, there being an original family of 92 regenerative chem chemical elements. In the year 1932, which is usually thought of as a year of depression, and therefore a low mo moment for society, it was quite the other way in the terms of the, uh, of the real success of man, because that was the year in which we had then the 92 chemical elements on the shelves, separated out and available to be reassociated in the preferred ways. And so all these new materials which we're making, I, I like, don't even like the word material, it's sort of deceiving. But these new chemical associations which we are developing, which make possible this kind of a structure which can have uh, a safe re-entry of those great heats and plunge in the seas at enormous velocity and keep man safe just a few inches behind it at cool and comfortable. That, 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 those are consequences of our being able to separate out the 92 basic patterns of chemical elements and reassociating them in the preferred ways. You know, a strange thought occurred to me as you're talking, because you, you denigrate this word material, and as you do, and you prove that ma you spoke of a materialistic age, the 19th, entering into a new non Even now, literally, using the word literally, you say man's thought. You see man conceiving, you know, space, time, everything, in which material becomes a secondary, a secondary matter. Really. There, there, I, I shun the word material because it also is it's built on the root matter. And the concept of matter uh, has now been com uh, completely obliterated by the most advanced of the scientific exploration, which in the last decade, the nuclear physicists, in, the, in uh, separating out the nucleus and its various components, which uh, came as great surprise to man that, that, that this, what he had thought was the, the key thing or matter, which was the atom, could be broken apart into an enormous number of su secondary components. He's found then that the nucleus of the atom involves negative particles, he calls, as well as positive particles. Now these negative particles, every positive particle has, has a negative counterpart, 
which means that there, the negative has all this, the uh, reverse characteristics. Therefore, the negative particles have literally reverse weight. The average of the weight of all of these is zero, and we discover that a man is dealing in pure principles. There is no matter. There are no things. There is no smallest thing. Matter involved in, infers a thing, a solid, a surface. The word solids and surface are gone. It is a, it is a pity that one of the latest phases of, of the modern, uh, uh, really applied science has been called solid state physics. Just uh, and This word was used just at the time when man discovered there are no solids. He's learned that, that uh, an atom is a completely discontinuous uh, 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 array of events, uh, like a great Milky Way, and nothing, there's nothing solid about it at all. And it, 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 I, I know how they happened to use it. They had thought in the solid state physics that they were going to be able to keep reducing the temperature of the experiment. They were going to take liquids down, so everything was going to get down to its to its crystalline, which they by they they confused the word crystalline and solid. <laughs> they suddenly discovered that some of them would not come to crystalline. They suddenly just went over in reverse again in the negative universe, so that uh, where the, the word solid just didn't uh, it doesn't hold. Well, well, Bucky Fuller, this is practically an hour in which you've been talking, simply uh, improvising, expressing your credo too through what you've been telling the world and indeed proving to it. Uh, perhaps one last, I know uh, one of your talks as you travel through various cities is the prospect for humanity. And you paint uh, uh, a prospect that is affirmative in contrast to so many prospects painted by others. And uh, one of your talks that was reprinted in the Saturday Review, the 40th anniversary issue opens, the scriptures were right. The meek have inherited the earth, but they do not know it. You still believe this? Yes, yes I'm, I'm convinced that uh, that is correct. Uh, very much so, and I feel that the, uh, for the moment, the uh, trustees of the will, <laughs> the lawyers and sense the managers, uh, politicians, the corporation managers, don't as yet really know quite how to handle this. They've never had such a big will to handle, so they're a little mildly confused. They haven't uh, gotten to completely probate it. And once they probate that thing, then we're going to see man on earth a real success. Buckminster Fuller, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I think uh, just as a uh, a sign off for me the refresh the refreshing aspect of listening to someone like Bucky Fuller talk uh, we, we hear so often of man's we open by saying men today seem to sing of man and man's impotence he's one of the things of man's potency and potentialities so good to hear this is our program for this morning and after this message a word about uh, tomorrow's program Tomorrow will be our tribute to one of the best of American songwriters, the late Johnny Mercer. Until then, take it easy, but take it.